the west of Ireland. Two hours before dawn, a farmer, his eldest son and six good cattle make ready to walk their six-mile journey to the fair. Around the valley, other lights stream out on a mosaic of small fields and low stone walls. There's the O'Malley's light and the Beans, there for the fair as well. So step out then and let them and the sun catch up. A few smears of smoke on a watery sky as the waking town rubs its eyes and blinks at the strangers. Here and there at crossroads and farm gates on the way, men and their beasts have joined your caravan. There's talk of prices at other fairs, of how the winter feed lasted and how well the lambing went. Now on the town's edge, as the dealers come to meet you, moving along the line, shouting their offers, you shake off the cold and gather your wits. It sounds a fair offer, but who knows the prices you'll hear inside the town. The dealers are impatient men. They would like to buy quickly and leave for another fair in another town. Better go into the town and take your stand and wait. A damp, dirty morning it is, what they call in the west a soft day. But the wind is shifting. It could be a fine day yet. One day it'll be his turn, but not just yet. For the moment at school and a long day of waiting for the bell at three o'clock that will release him and his friends into the tangling, hand-slapping circus of a Connemara affair. Yet they're lucky enough, these boys in the town, for boys living in remote parts, far from any town, the fair is something to dream of. As exciting and frightening as the coral islands they read about in books. The day they come here will be the culmination of an age of looking forward, the end of their boyhood. Perhaps until his first fair, the boy will have lived in a place where there are no shops, only a travelling store, no radio, no television. Or there's a school, but the school tells him of remote things, things that will never touch him personally. The fair will be his graduation. For a while, however, he will do no more than watch the stock and watch his father tangling with the dealers. Ah, oh, the dealers. These are the great travelling swashbucklers of his vision. Men who travel to fairs every day of the week. When the day comes that he must tangle with one of these, he will leap into manhood or fall into disgrace. You have your stand now, and maybe it's time to take a walk through the fair. Plenty of cattle today. You wish maybe they weren't so plentiful. The dealers are crafty men, but you know a trick or two yourself. You know, for example, how important is the appearance of an animal. So on the morning of the fair, you have washed your beasts in water that's thick with soap. It's not enough just to wash and scrub it. You must fluff out the hair and he will look twice as healthy. You can even use hair oil to make him shinier again and a little boot polish on his eyelashes, but you must be careful. For if it's a wet morning, your beast will swim in bright yellow suds like a lady in a bubble bath. And his eyes will stream black tears like the same lady weeping through her mascara. Bells are booming down the boreens, white the mist along the grass. Now the Julias, Maves and Maureens move between the fields to mass. There's the publican's wife, maybe, off to pray for a good day's trade, and the bank manager, with the whole town to pray for. For these good people of the town, the day is beginning, but for the men of the fair, the working day is already half over. Here a deal is on the way to being made. In another part of the world, two men will perhaps shake hands after a deal is settled. In an Irish fair, they shake hands throughout the negotiations, as a constant token of good faith. Every offer, and naturally every offer is a last offer, is accompanied by a slap at the hand. And soon enough, yet no sooner than the ritual can decently take, a deal is done and the new owner marks his calf. Another dealer makes an offer. The boy is embarrassed. His job is simply to watch the cattle for his father. He's not trusted to sell yet, but to admit this is a blow to his prestige. Yet even the shame is mingled with a sense of relief that he won't for a while yet have to tangle with this fearsome man. 
Often there's a third man in the deal. He may be with the buyer or the seller, and his job is to make the bargain, just as another man in another situation might have the job of making a match. They are both honoured trades, and it's a great source of pride to be known as a man that can make a bargain, or for that matter, a marriage. And there are times when a dealer can lose patience, when all his generosity is thrown back in his face. He won't be trifled with any longer. A man has his pride. But he's a forgiving man. Generously, he makes one more offer. The seller still not impressed. There's the bargain maker again, not so welcome this time. Never been so insulted. A quick mug of tea to ponder a while on man's inhumanity to man. Somewhere else a bargain is made and paid for from a gluttonous roll of money. It might even be a cheque, but this is not so common. A roll of money in an elastic band is the sign of a man of substance, but any hop the twig can wave a chequebook. Amazing how a cup of tea can mellow a man and persuade him to forgive and forget. It'll be a great wonder if this bargain is ever struck. But other men have their business done. They leave the boy to watch the stock and off with them into the pub to boast about the bargain they made and how they put one over on the dealer. It has been busy here since early morning, and wrists are sore from drawing the creamy black pints of stout. Outside the warm, convivial tap room, the work goes on. Many of the calves are sick from travelling, for they've been carried a long distance from Cork and Kerry and Glimerick far to the south. These are dairy counties, where calves are bought more cheaply. There's great profit in them for men who have the enterprise and the energy to bring them maybe 200 miles to a fair in Connemara. And what would he give? What would he give? Huh? You guys, you look at his strength today. Look at him. Sir. Look at him. A lamb to the slaughter. For the lambs, too, it is their first feel of the harsh world of reality. A world where the only familiar feature is the warm odour. If only it would stay still. Up to now, they've known only the spongy turf of a mountainside, etched here and there with rock. Here, all is rock. No grass and no escape. And there are other creatures here who would be more at home on the mountains. And one whose only home in the world is the west of Ireland, the Connemara Pony. chariot race, just a line of asses and carts waiting to be sold. Perhaps this is the only way to be sure of moving an ass. Still, an ass is as useful now as it always was on the terrain of Connemara, whether it's for bringing turf from the bog, or milk to the creamery, or the old people to mass. The ass is the great stoic. He has a mind of his own.
In recent years, they have lost none of their appeal. Even in far off places, this young piebald mare ass, a great rarity, will surely fetch a fine price from some New England stockbroker anxious to raise his standing at the country club. There are pigs too at the fair. Most of the local farms support a sow or two. You have to be careful with sows at a fair, because if you upset a sow and she gets loose, oh, there's no end to the havoc she might cause. A bad sign that, for the pigs at least. For as any Irishman will tell you, nothing tastes as good with biled bacon as biled cabbage. But the main money spinners at the fair are the cattle. And it's the cattle marts mushrooming up around the country that have sounded the death knell for fairs like this one. They will tell you here that while there are fairs, it's there they'll bring their cattle. For why should they change? It's the cattle that provide the money, the noise and the dot the three chief constituents of all commerce. is well on now and the rain has cleared most of the deals are done that will be done men and boys are tired and hungry it's seven hours since some of them set out and that bacon and egg you had for breakfast didn't last you very long Maybe the man next to you will watch the cattle for a minute to let you off for a sandwich and a cup of tea. And as they say, hunger is a great sauce. It will all give you a great thirst. And in the pub, business is booming as men refuel for the journey home. For the men who haven't sold yet and who need their wits about them, there's a mug of treacle tea. Seems everyone is thirsty. And there's always someone who can't get into the bar. Unless, of course, you're a friend of the publican. You can buy anything at a fair, not just livestock. If a man lives at the end of a boreen in the heart of the country, the day of the fair is an occasion for making a hundred small purchases. There would be provisions for a start and maybe fuel, a new scissors for the wife, sweets for the young ones and maybe a rattle for the child. You might even buy a suit for the eldest lad if the day had gone well, or a length of cloth for the lady to sew a dress. Whatever it would be, it would be brought home wrapped in brown paper. And the more parcels are tied up, the more exciting will be the untying. Often the paper will be soggy with rain, or even stout. But the opening of the parcels is awaited all day at the home farm. And it's a poor man that will bring nothing. I don't give a dog diddy about cash today, tell you the truth. Try your skill and win a china bowl. The business is done and it's time to unwind. Money is only a passport from one lousy public house to the other. If you have enough wood, you can kiss any man's wife. If you have none, you can get three months. Straighten yourself up, Jack. Hold up your head now. Look like, look like a bloody man. Plans for the evening, maybe. I wonder now, ma'am, would you be free tonight? It's near the end of trading now, and things are going cheap. Nearly time to start for home. Our men will go the way they came, one on foot, 
the other going ahead with the bicycle to bring home early news of the day's events. Now there's a tempting sight. I wonder now out of the day's take would he notice the price of a hat. The men who have been buying will have to use their ingenuity to find a means of transport. The big buyers will have their trucks and trailers. But if it's only a sheep or a calf, well, it's not hard to find room. The Angelus, and a man prays briefly. A reflex action of someone whose mind for the moment is still on more worldly things. By six o'clock, when the Angelus rings again, the same streets will be deserted. Men are gathering in little knots, some outside the bank where they wait for the dealers to come out and pay them. And the payout, slow and deliberate as tradition has decreed. Perhaps it's this same slowness that will mean the end of fairs in an age when leisure will have no place. It all went quietly enough. Ah, there was a time when one of these men would hardly have been enough to keep the peace. A time when a fair day in the west of Ireland was like roundup day in a wilder west than this. But that's past now. And soon the image of a fair day will be no more than something for old men to conjure for their children. The stories will be coloured by repetition and by failing memories. And the chances are that the young people listening to tales, affairs they never knew, will not feel that anything has been missed. And it will not be easy to tell them the truth of what has been lost. Any more than it is easy even now to describe that elusive alchemy, which for one golden day in every month, held the secret of turning boys into men and men into boys. <laughs>